Hello and welcome to The Solve Network. My name is Shane Borza and I'll be your host. Along with my co-founder, Benjamin Goss, we'd like to welcome you. Our mission is to provide solutions and create a network of experts for you to learn from. Now, this show is a little different than most podcasts, as it is actually a live call held twice a month. If you can, please join us on the first and third Thursday of each month so you can get your questions answered live and direct from the experts themselves. If you're an expert, please contact me at shaneborza.com so you can be a part of the network. And now, here's our show. Today on the Solve Network, we have guest expert Benjamin Goss. He has multiple decades of experience in both sales and marketing and is going to talk to us today about the straight line sales system. So stay tuned. Scene one, Apple, take one. Hi, I'm Shane Borza, your content creator coach. I have two books on filmmaking, Film Notes, where you learn to write, direct, and produce, and the Film Notes Workbook, where you can learn checklists and paperwork to streamline creating your content. Available at ShaneBorza.com. I also have filmmaker resources like the Paperwork Bundle with over 300 documents, the Sound Effects Bundle with almost 3,000 files, and the Music Bundle featuring 900 tracks of all genres. Want to build your professional credits? Become an associate producer and get listed on IMDb. Let me help you get your art out into the world. Scene one, Apple, take one. I wanted to start out with an interesting, or I think it's interesting. I wanted to start out with a question, and I think I've I've already told this to you guys, but for the sake of people that will watch it in the future, hopefully it'll be new for some, if not all. So do any of you know the connection between the goldfish and sales? Uh, attention span. Yes, Why? Uh, because we only have, uh, I forget what the number is, but you know, it's like 15 seconds to, uh, maintain the attention of a client. So one of the reasons that, uh, or one of the things that, um, uh, Jordan Belfort talks about in his book, and I think it was called the way of the wolf. Honestly, I don't even remember now. I think it's called the way of the wolf. He also wrote the wolf of Wall street, but the way of the wolf is about his selling system, which he calls the straight line selling system. And if you want to hear straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, you can go on YouTube and and find some content there. But one of the things that he talks about, um, and it's interesting because I talked about it before I ever heard from him, it is is about attention span. Uh, The reason I use the goldfish is because the average attention span, at least when the study was done, the average attention span of a goldfish is... Seven seconds, eight seconds? Eight seconds, the average attention oh. span of a human being is. <laughs> so we, we, as a large sentient individual, don't can't even manage the attention span of a goldfish. So if you can't get a goldfish to pay attention to you, what hope do you have for a human being, right? Uh, and then another interesting thing that uh, he talks about in the book is he talks about, you know, how much time you actually have to get someone's attention. And most people don't realize this, but the sale, um, the sale in person is made within the first basically 10 seconds. People form an impression of you, your tone, your pitch, your dress, your, you know, everything about you. We can say, hey, don't judge a book by its cover, but let's be honest. Every, you know, when we look at people, guys, especially when we look at a girl, guys, look them up, you know. Some guys look them up and down, come up with a score. You know, I don't do that, but some guys do. I don't remember back in their college days. Oh, she's a seven. Oh, look at that talent, right? So if you think about that in a less uh, sexual manner, everybody apprises who they come across, right? The minute you, you know, when you're walking, walking down the mall, our brain is constantly categorizing and we have an whether you realize it or not, you have both an emotional as well as an intellectual reaction to the people that you're walking past, their dress, you know, the things going on around you, you know, our brains are wired. So we filter out most of that stuff. Most of that stuff we're not conscious of, but if somebody said, Hey, what did you think about blah, blah, blah. You'd be like, what? Oh, you mean that person that, Oh yeah. Right. And then you can say what you thought about that person. 
Well, the reality is when you're when you're knocking on a door, and I use knocking on a door euphemistically, right? I'm going to just talk about how how we present ourselves to somebody that we're, we're talking to the for, for the first time. There's there's really there's really only two ways that, that happens. One is over the phone, and two is in person. In person, and I don't remember the name of the study, he mentions it. Some people say it's been debunked. Other people say it's totally valid, but you've probably heard it before. And it's basically some variation of 55% of your communication is body language. Um, 35% is um, uh, tonality or pitch. Um, But only 10% of it is actually the words that you use. Now, that's not to say that you can't say the wrong words because you can, because some words are, will trigger, right? You've heard of triggering, right? And I don't mean it in a snowflake millennial kind of way, but certain words will trigger certain types of emotion, right? So you want to be careful about the words that you use because you don't want to trigger or create the, the wrong impression, so what he what uh, Jordan talks about is he, he gets into he gets actually gets in a little bit more into the data and science. I was a little bit surprised, actually. He talks about attention span, how much time you have to make that first impression. You know, all those things are important. Um, I kind of wrote this little little thing down as a kind of a, a reminder or something to think about. The, the sales sales is a game, okay? It's a physical, mental, and emotional game. High performance individuals have to be optimally performing in all three zones, right? It's actually more important how you present yourself, whether that's over the phone audibly or in person, which has both an audible as well as a physicality component, right? How are you presenting yourself if you show up wearing wrinkled clothes and going, you know? that, you know, people are either going to like listen to you out of pity or they're going to be like, get the hell away from me. Cause you know, I don't know. They don't like to help people. Right. So one of the things that Jordan Belfort talks about is he's like, you've got to be up, you've got to be positive. You know, it's kind of like, uh, if I call up the phone and I'm talking to Shane, I'm going to say, Hey, is Shane there? Right. As opposed to hi, I'm leaving for Mr. Morza or is it, or is they, um, you know, um, you know, I mean, I'm overemphasizing my my emphasis for the making for the point of making the point, right? If you sound up, positive, you know, people pay attention to that and they're more likely to listen to you than if you're too soft, um, you know, they can't hear you. Now there is a there is a time and a place for being, um, you know, using a whisper like when you t- when you want to tell somebody something, get them to kind of lean in and like, listen, you got to understand, right? This is super important, right? You can actually lower your voice for emphasis, which communicates the concept of I'm, 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 you know, I'm telling you a secret, right? You know, that can actually be more impactful than being like, oh my goodness, and guess what you get for thirty nine ninety nine? It'll be so amazing, right? I mean, people don't really respond to that kind of overblown emotionalism anymore, except children. So, that is true. You can get children excited, right? You know, hey, there's a child in every one of us. I mean, some of us will still respond to some of that stuff. So um, I'm going to send my notes to Shane from the book, but the straight line selling system has uh, five components to it. And the first three are what he calls the three key tests. And the three key tests are number one, your prospect must love your product. Number two is your prospect must love and, I'm sorry, your prospect must trust and connect with you. Number three, your prospect must trust and connect with your company. Wow, that's more of a tongue twister. Twi- tongue twister? <laughs> that's more of a tongue twister than I was anticipating. Thank you, Jesus. Got through that. All right. So the reality is like, you know, when you're talking to people, you could almost ask them, look, on a scale of one to 10, you know, what's your level of interest in the product? The words that you move, right, or on a scale of one to 10, how am I doing here? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? You want to internally uh, in, try to gauge that on your part, but you could actually ask somebody in the course of chatting with them, hey, where are we at? What do I need to do, right? How do I get you to a 10, right? People are will run from fear, they run from pain, and they run towards pain and pleasure and comfort. 
So if you can help somebody be comfortable with you, comfortable with the product and comfortable with your company, they're more likely to purchase. But somebody who's a five, I'm comfortable. Yeah, whatever. I'm kind of ambivalent. Yeah, I like you. I don't dislike you. They're less likely to buy. But you move them to a 10 in all three areas, you're more likely to, to be able to trigger the sale. So the words that you need, the words that you use, the illustrations that you use, they, they really need to help move, move you towards a 10 on each scale. What's, what's the number one question that somebody asks um, that immediately tells you it's a sales call? Uh, how much, sales are, you, how much huh? are you willing to invest? No. It's usually the first thing that they say, hey, or let's see, hey, my name's Ben. Is John there? John gets on the phone. Hey, John, this is Ben. What do most people say after that? Like, how are you today or something like that? Yes, exactly. The minute you say, how are you doing today? That absolutely says small talk, salesperson, not interested. I'm zoning out, tuning out, hanging up. See you later. Bye-bye. Right. So you have to if you're going to be having a sales conversation, whether that's a job interview, um, you are, I don't know, you're asking for a discount at a restaurant. You want a discount on clothes. You want to sell somebody on uh, whatever. Right. The, the number one turnoff, like I don't want to say universally, but almost everybody can figure out, oh, this is a sales call. Right. Because why are you saying, how are you? Like, you know, I don't know you from Adam. Why the F do you care? Um, you know, when I'm training guys on how to knock doors, I, I tell them, look, you, there, there, are, there are two questions on people's minds when, when you knock on their door, right? Because you're, you're interrupting them in their domain. Question number one is, why the F are you at my door? And who the F are you? Uh -huh. Right now, some people will be very agitated. Right. And some people are going to be like, eh, you know, but at the end of the day, it all boils down to that basic, that basic emotion. Right. You know, why are you here? Right. And that's why your your appearance, your tonality, how you come across, you come across as somebody I need to listen to or you come across as somebody I need you to get off my front porch because you clearly don't know what you're doing. Right. So you can either talk with the air of authority and positivity or you can talk with the air of I'm not sure what I'm doing here. And God, forgive me for interrupting your life. You know, if I'm at your door, you know, there's something you need to learn. Like, I don't waste my time walking around talking to strangers because I like it. Mm -hmm. uh, I do it because uh, they need my help. They need my service. And if they don't get my help they're very likely to get screwed or not even understand that their property is being devalued, et cetera. Right. So, so <sighs> is, um, is there an opening line that you recommend for phone or for in-person contact? You need to answer those two questions. So for example, you know, I sell storm restoration, right? So when I knock on somebody's door and they open the door, and they say, you know, some variation of, can I help you? Who are you? What's up? Right. You know, everybody, you know, because I've been selling for a really long time, I try to take, take my um, cues from that person. I pay attention to the property when I'm walking up to it. Um, you know, what am I observing? Do they have like, I don't know, like a Packers flag in the front yard? I mean, do they, is there, are there cars in their house plastered with Ohio University or Michigan stuff, right? Whatever, you know, I don't know those things, but if they had a university of Michigan, like, Oh, my dad went and lived in Detroit and I got a lot of, I got family that went there. So you're a big Michigan fan, huh? <laughs> right. You know, <clears throat> sometimes talking about something briefly about why you're not related to why you're there just helps breaks the ice and get people comfortable. But, um, you know, if you, if you drag it on too long, people will get irritated and they're like, you know, can you get to the point, please? Because, like, I, I was eating or I was watching my show or whatever and you interrupted me and I'm very politely standing here so you can please stop, stop wasting my time. 
Um, you know, when you're doing, when you're calling somebody on the phone, how do we approach somebody? Well, you should be looking at their LinkedIn profile, paying attention to their company. There's other things that you can, you know, you know, creep them on Facebook, see if you can learn anything about them, right? A lot of people have public profiles. The point isn't because you're trying to figure out how to date the person, right? The point is you're trying to figure out if there's points of commonality that you can use when you're talking to that person. So whenever I open and I'm like, hey, my name's Ben. Um, Do you have a couple of minutes? Is now a good time to talk, right? Because you're demonstrating respect. You're not assuming that that they've got time now. Um, and sometimes people will be relieved. They're like, Oh, fantastic. But most people will be like, sure. I got a few minutes. What's going on. Right. Then you, you need to communicate in a 30 second elevator pitch, why you're there, why you're calling them, why you're interrupting their life. As long as you do that stuff, if you get through the first 30 to 45 seconds in good fashion, you are 90% of the way towards making the sale because they've already paused long enough and they've already decided that they, they like you enough to stand there and talk to you. The likelihood that you'll make the sale just continues to increase the longer you're there. But that first minute is absolutely critical. If you don't do well in the first 20 to 30 seconds, um, you know, they say, I think it's like uh, you need eight positive impressions to overwhelm a negative one. And if you've already triggered them on the first one in less than a minute, the odds that you'll have seven or eight positive interactions after that, probably not very good. I mean, unless you're just having a bad day. I mean, I guess it's possible. And I follow up multiple people all the time. I follow up multiple times with people all the time, but sometimes you can just get a sense that people just don't like you, right? (laughs) Like, okay, dude, you clearly have an issue or ma'am, I'm sorry, something I said really torqued you. I don't know, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that's helpful, thank you. Um, the, um, the, the, another thing to understand, you know, outside of the fact that the words that you use need to move people towards 10 on the scale is that objections are just a smoke screen of certainty. And that's really, um, kind of paraphrasing Jordan Belfort's, um, terminology. He calls it certainty, right? On, a, on those first three key tests, how certain are you on a scale of one to 10, right? If somebody has an objection, what they're, what they're really doing is they're saying, tell me more. They're not saying that, what they're saying is, I, I don't believe you or I don't quite get X, Y, Z, right? So when somebody throws up an objection, whatever that is, or like, you know, like, well, I just, I don't know if I see the value here. You know, you want to stop, pause, repeat back to them what you've heard them say so that they understand that you're hearing them and that it's important. And then depending on what it is, it like if, if it's something like I don't see the value, say, James, I am so sorry. Uh, I hope you can forgive me because I just haven't been effective enough at explaining the value to you. Can you give me a couple of minutes to go back and explain why I see this is really critical and valuable for you and your family, your business, your blood, your life, whatever, right? So an objection gives you permission to loop, right? Go back to the information because it's either something about the product or it's something about you or it's something about your company. And, and Jordan Belfort talks about looping, right? An objection just gives you the chance to reset on whatever that key component is. Um, then the other two pillars of his, um, of his system is uh, what he calls the two keys to communication strategy. One is the invisible force and two is the pain threshold. And the invisible force is the invisible force that prevents a purchase. In other words, their action threshold is probably another way to put it, right? So action threshold and their pain threshold. So people, you, you want to move somebody's... Um, action threshold from high to low. In other words, you want to lower the bar to entry, right? Um, And the reality is that what they've discovered is that the action threshold is malleable and movable um, for every person in every situation, right? Because what's your action threshold? Your action threshold is based on a combination of beliefs about how you make decisions it's it's your beliefs on on how you make buying decisions more specifically and when you talk about buying decisions you're also talking about attitudes about money right your attitude about money and your attitude about a buying decision 
they might actually conflict. And if that's the case, you may have a lot of um, conflict in your financial life. <clears throat> and then they also have ideas, perceptions, or feelings about salespeople selling to them, right? They say that the easiest people to sell to are salespeople. Why? Well, <laughs> this is what we do for a living. We want to be persuaded. Whereas somebody who's like, yeah, I don't know, an accountant and they're the king of data, they don't understand that they had to sell somebody to get their job. They had to sell somebody on buying their car at the price they wanted, whatever, right? They just handle the buying. They, they just handle that sales process differently. But it doesn't mean that you, you can't get there with them, right? They may have a seemingly or a perceptively higher threshold for action, but if you can speak their language, you can bring that threshold down, right? Well, at the same time you're bringing the action threshold down, you need to increase the pain threshold because just because you have a low action threshold doesn't mean you're going to pull the trigger. You know, um, you know, buying a candy bar is a pretty low action threshold, right? But just because I'm standing there in the convenience store doesn't mean I'm going to buy it. So what do they do to try to trigger your action threshold, right? They two for one, get the king size double candy bar for the price of one, right? And that doesn't say that, but I mean, you don't have a video, but you know, you've got the little tags or whatever. And then everybody has that internal salesman, right? When they're looking at marketing material, everybody has a voice that they read in and it's not usually, I mean, it might be theirs, but not usually, right? You know, if you think back to when you were a kid, usually the commercials that impacted you are the ones that have a tendency to influence how you perceive all those things in the future. If you've had particularly positive or particularly negative selling, buying experiences in your past, whether as a teenager or as an adult, those will have significant impacts on how they interact with people in the future. Sometimes you might wanna to try to unpack things a little bit because if you keep getting objections, right? Smoke screens, but you're still in the presentation, you're gonna to have to figure out what the problem is. And the only way you can uncover that is with quality questions. Pain threshold is, you know, people move away from what creates pain and towards whatever they believe will solve their problem. So the pain threshold to me is really about creating urgency, right? You know, um, what's another way to create urgency? Um, I don't know. You know, my tires are starting to get a little low on tread on the back. Um, and I was kind of paying attention to that, right? But on my last trip to Chicago, I looked at my front tires and I'm like, oh my God, my tires are going bald, right? So my pain threshold for getting tires went from, I'm gonna have to get some soon to, oh my God, I can't drive back to Richmond, I can't drive back to North Carolina or Virginia until I replace my tires. So there are things that increase our pain because I don't wanna have a blowout and run off the road at a really bad place. Plunging down the side of a mountain doesn't thrill me, right? <laughs> Even on skis. <laughs> um, uh, versus, um, you know, hey, I know I'm going to have to do this soon, but, you know, the tread hasn't worn down that far yet. <laughs> I'd like to get where I'm not always down to the steel belt on my tires. So um, just to reiterate, let's, let's reconnect with what those five core elements are again. Love the product, trust and connect to you, trust and connect with your company, lower the action threshold, increase the pain threshold. So... Um, I'm just looking at these uh, notes. I kind of took them in sequence. Uh, you've got to take immediate control of the sa sales encounter. And he says you actually have four seconds to do that. In 0 0.25 seconds in person, somebody is making a judgment about you, whether or not they want to listen to you, talk to you. And then it takes five seconds to finalize that impression. Over the phone, you've got four seconds. Then at the most, you have 10 seconds to recover or cement that impression. And this is universally human. It doesn't matter what culture you're in. It doesn't matter if it's Japan, Africa, Russia, China, the United States, it doesn't matter. It's universally human. They've done the tests. It's the same for everyone. Obviously, we all talk different languages, literally, but this emotional, um, I guess I would call it an emotional mental thing is an absolute universal truth. 
So how do you how do you deal with this? You you want to present that you are sharp as a tack, enthusiastic as hell, and expert in your field. That's why I do well when I'm outdoors. People just like I'm positive. I know what I'm talking about, and people just figure that out when they're listening to me. Perception management. It takes eight eight subsequent positive impressions to overcome a negative impression. Most sales encounters don't provide that. He lists the the uh, the parts of communication as tonality, modality, and uh, I guess I should come up with something else for words that rhymes with ality, huh? <laughs> for verbosity. <laughs> 45% tone, 45% modality, which is body language, and 10% of the words. Uh, then he says that there's 10 tonalities and 10 modalities. I didn't write them down. I don't remember that he actually went into all of that, but it would definitely be something that's interesting to look into. Basically, universally, communication styles break down into 10 and 10. So maybe we can look at that in the future. Um, you really need to look like some one, something that I've come to understand the last probably five to six years that I really didn't understand in the first 15 years. Like first 15 years of my life, I was good at sales, but there was just some of it I just didn't understand. Like, I don't understand why it works for some people and not for others. Like, why doesn't everybody just buy from me? Like, just buy from me. I got what you need. Like, why would, why would you not sign on the dotted line, right? Like to me, I assume the sale to the point that I'm, I'm surprised when people don't buy um, a little bit, but I'm a little bit more in tune now than I was, you know, being confident is important, but if you're so confident that you're missing the signals that people are giving you, then you're literally just wasting your time and you don't want to do that. Right. So emotional connection is 45, 45 for the emotional decision. I don't even remember why I wrote that down. You, uh, I, I guess what I'm saying here, what he was saying is, is really what I'm saying is that, I don't know if you realize this, but people make the decision to purchase emotionally first. It has nothing to do with either logic, rationality, right? It's emotional first. Now, some people are more susceptible to getting excited and pulling the trigger, but at the end of the day, how you feel about the purchase has more to do with whether or not that takes place than anything else. And if somebody has an incredibly high negative impression about making a purchase of the product or taking that step or whatever, then if you can't overcome that negative impression, they're not going to make that buying purchase. It doesn't matter how much logic you put in front of them. You're not going to be able to overwhelm. You can't overwhelm emotion with logic. Logic, a lot of times, is how people support or rationalize or explain the emotional decision that they made. Now, I'll use this in what I call the, the warm down phase, like when somebody makes the commitment to sign and where they're signing. You know, you might say something like, hey, I just want to let you know that future you is going to thank current you or present you for making this decision. Because uh, um, I think when all is said and done, you're going to have that peace of mind. You're going to feel really good about it because and then you want to remind them of the things that were important as to why they're making the decision. And the warm down is emotional not logical. It is first emotional. It's second logical. Right. And, um, you want to ask questions that are tie downs. Like that makes sense. Doesn't it? Oh, are you picking up what I'm putting down? Like, Hey, you know, sometimes people get lost cause they say I'm a little bit too wordy. Are you like, does it, does what I'm saying make sense to you? Or do you need me to explain it a little bit more? Right. So words are 10% logic based decisions. Now, if you screw up the emotional connection, I guess he was talking about um, tone and modality are about emotional connection and the emotional decision making. But your words, you know, only 10 percent of your complete message has anything to do with being logic or basing the decision being based on logic. Right. If you make a mistake in either, whether it's your 45, 45, your tonality, your modality, or if you make a mistake on your words, if you trigger somebody with bad, bad word choice, um, like I tell people, don't send somebody a contract. You're sending them an agreement. They're not signing a contract. They're authorizing an agreement, right? Massive difference, right? Because a lot of people, when they hear contract, think, oh, attorney. And if it's somebody with money, they're going to be like, oh, I need to have my attorney review this. Why? <laughs> no, you don't. Like, 
the only reason you're going to need an attorney is if for some reason we get at odds and is there anything that you don't understand? Well, I'm going to deliver what I've promised. And this is the safeguard that says I'm going to deliver what I've promised to you. Does that make sense? That makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> and then I didn't take too many notes on it, but, you know, I talked about how this sales or selling is a physical game. It is a mental game. It is an emotional game, right? You know, sales is built on the no. And we need to get people efficiently to say no so that we're not wasting our time trying to sell somebody who really isn't going to buy anyway. Like, I don't know how many times you found yourself in a conversation with somebody trying to sell your service that just went 30 or 45 minutes too long because you just kept droning on and on about how awesome you were, or you let them drone on and on about their problems, but you never made the pivot or turn. You weren't able to control the conversation such that you were able to take what they were saying and then tie it back to how what you've got solves their problem. You know, just having a conversation for the sake of having a conversation is great, but most people aren't having a business selling conversation for the sake of making friends. Now, your clients may become friends at some level, but at the end of the day, it's still a commercial relationship and you need to provide value. And if you're not efficiently moving them towards making the decision, then that's also bad. That's not only bad for you from a business standpoint, but it's bad for them from a time standpoint, right? Um. So part of how you manage all of that, you, you know, managing your own emotions, right? Like, how do I stay up? How do I stay positive? He talks about um, NLP, uh, Neuro Linguistic Programming, in terms of how to make sure that you're managing your communication, right? And then he also talks about something called anchoring, where like you can set, you can set your mood or put yourself in a certain state, mentally speaking, and uh, he talks about a product called Boom Boom, which is basically a um, like I thought it was some I thought it was an aerosol. I bought a pack of it and it's literally kind of like a smelling salt. Right. You just open it, take a whiff of it. And the way it works is you have to, as he puts it, organically put yourself in a high state of euphoria. Like, I don't know if your team won the Super Bowl, like when that happens, take a whiff, right? You're setting an anchor. If you, I don't know, you hit a hundred pushups for the first time and that totally like you just, you're euphoric, take a hit. Um, you have your favorite dessert and it just, uh, you remember your youth and life and things are good. And I'm in front of the fire and it's awesome. And, right. Set the anchor. Why is that important? Because before you go into a, a sales meeting or a big meeting, you can set your emotion once you've organically set that anchor. Then all you have to do to put yourself in that emotional state because our emotions are more strongly tied to our, our sense of smell, I guess, than anything else. Like out of the five senses, um, smell seems to be more emotionally connected to our emotional state than the other senses are. Like the smell of cookies, warm cookies, for some people reminds them of their grandmother's kitchen at Christmas like that kind of a concept, right? Or if you smell snickerdoodles, you're like, oh, Christmas, right? And, and then your mind emotionally has a, you know, your, your mind emotionally color, colors your environment with all of that stuff. Some people don't feel that positivity because they had a negative upbringing. But for somebody like me, you know, Christmas lights, warmth, ah, good feelings, right? So... <clears throat> That's why, you know, when you're interacting with people, you want to find out what's their, you know, find out what's their profession. I always ask people what their profession is, because if I know what their profession is, I'm a well-read person. So I know a lot. I know a little bit about a lot of things. And usually if somebody tells me what their profession is, just because I was in the staffing business, I can usually come up with an illustration or I can come up with an analogy that helps me tie what I do to what they do. That way I can have that emotional connection of, oh, he gets me, right? Now they may not verbalize it in their head that, oh, he gets me, but when the light comes on and they're kind of like, oh, like people lean in, they give you the body language, you get it, you feel it, you know, all that fun stuff. There's a couple of different services out there that do like quick reads or quick summaries of books. 
And um, if you do what I like to do, and I think Shane started doing it as well, is like I use Audible and I put it on 1.75 or 2x speed, and I can listen to a 40-minute summary in 20 minutes. So, and the the reason I do that is because if I don't listen to it at that speed, I don't focus on it. I don't, I don't, like my mind starts to wander. It's like, uh, like my mind moves, your mind moves faster than your mouth can talk. So because you can speed up the prison, you can always rewind it and slow it down if you want to hear something again, right? So I don't know. For me, that works. That's but, a good idea. Um, I hadn't, I've heard of the, I know that you can speed it up. I think your rationale for speeding it up is really good, and I hadn't thought of it that way. Well, the interesting thing is when I listen to a book at 2x speed, I can listen to an eight-hour full book, right? I can listen to an eight-hour book in four hours, and a lot of my drives are four hours. So, uh, you know, I do get phone calls and stuff, so I get interrupted a lot. But if I didn't get interrupted and I drive at night, I can listen to one, even two books, depending on how much I'm driving. But, um, you know, it helps keep your mind ticking along. So the one thing that I was hoping to interact with you guys on was the concept that sales is a is a physical, mental, and emotional game. And I don't know that anybody's really put that out there in the world. Like to me, that's kind of my twist on some of what Jordan Belfort is saying, because <clears throat> in a, in a, some of that kind of came from Shane talking about, you know, equalized coaching, because frankly, a good salesperson is really coaching and mentoring their prospect to make a quality decision. Now, as long as you're ethical, moral, and you know what you're doing, then you can passionately, persuasively present in such a way that you can coach somebody, essentially. And I don't mean coach them in a negative way, right? But you can provide them with the information that helps them make a quality decision. Um, you know, with the, with the explosion of information on the Internet, that's a little bit harder to do today. People's skepticism is so much higher. We live in a really divided society. But, you know, I think it's really important, you know, Jordan's five core principles make a lot of sense to me because, you know, I don't like to beat around the bush necessarily. Like I'd like to move somebody from open to close in 30 minutes to an hour if I can. You know, there's there's home selling. Um, there are people that do in-home sales and it takes them like three to four hours to do a pitch. And to me, that's just mind numbing. Like, oh, my God. Yes. Yeah. Like, wow. Stab me. Stab me in the knee with a spoon. Like, good God. I, I need an ACL reconstruction. That was just painful. Right. Yeah. So I don't like that. And because I don't like that, I have trouble selling like that. So I don't know if that helps me sell more or not, but you know, the other thing that I like about straight line selling is that the idea that you're getting to the point, right? You need to find out where people are at and see if you can move their products to meet them or your service to where they're at. So if you think about things being physical, mental, emotional, right? You need to be physically fit. You've got to have the endurance. You've got to be, you know, physically ready to take the challenges because it's mentally and emotionally stressful to go and sell to somebody, right? Because you're constantly analyzing what you're saying before you say it, and you're also trying to listen to the other person. That's why team selling sometimes works better because if you have one person selling and the other person listening, then the other person can kick in and say, hey, just want to let you know, blah, 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 right? Because Usually if somebody's only observing, they'll pick up on stuff that the person who's speaking doesn't pick up on, right? Our tendency when we're communicating is like, I'm talking, 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 talking. And then when the prospect speaks, it's like, I'm just thinking about what I'm going to say to you when you're done talking, right? And it's really hard to turn that off. So like Shane's coaching has been working with me on awareness and I didn't realize it, but my tuning into a customer to try to see where they're at is really about awareness, right? It's not just awareness for myself. It's also awareness with where the client is. If I'm not aware with where that client is physically, are they tired? Are they entered? Like, how do they, you know, how are they physically feeling right now? If somebody's exhausted after a really hard day at work, they may not be in a good frame of mind to make a decision, Right. Um, mentally speaking, right? Where are they? Did they, you know, did they lose a family member two weeks ago? Um, you know, did they lose a job? You know, are they having success like mentally? Like, you know, what am I thinking about right now? Right. 
So there are other ways to get into somebody's mental state without saying, hey, how you doing, right? You know, sometimes I'll say to somebody, so what's new in your life? You know, any recent successes you want to share? I like to hear positive stories about what's going on in other people's lives. You know, can, can you give me five minutes on what's working for you? You know, um, you know, it depends on what you're selling, right? If you're, it's important to connect, but you don't want to spend so much time connecting that you don't get to the point of making the sale, right? Uh, and then there's the emotional aspect of it too, right? Like, are you sitting in, in at the kitchen table with mom and dad and the kids are running around in the background and they're screaming and yelling and stressing mom out because she's been stressed out all day? Yeah, I agree with you, Ben. I think that that is a very accurate way to describe it. You have to be physically – so first off, one thing that we know um, is that there's this incredible degree of, like, uh, neuro regulation. Uh, some people in the kind of psychology field call it like interoception. So we know that there is this kind of like our nervous systems can kind of come into like a resonance with one another when we're in, interacting with people. And so there's the importance of like understanding what's going on with your prospect physically, what's going on with yourself physically, the emotional component. And the, so there's like the emotional decision making and the rational kind of uh, justification. So I think that uh, using those three kind of explanatory models is really helpful. And I think one of when you think about the physical concept, one thing that I think probably might not get a lot of attention is the fear that you might experience going into a, a potential sales conversation, right? Especially if you're freaking door knocking. I mean, geez, if you're door knocking, you might get a gun pulled on you, right? Like there's like a, a real fear that could exist if you're doing like in-person cold call, right? Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's a significant thing to address with the folks that you train up. Did you have any kind of like, alarm bell or a light bulb go off about things that he was saying being, you know, kind of the same as things that you want to do. Cause I know, again, you're dealing with people who are, you know, litigious dealing with lots of reports, you know, they're under lots of stress. Um, they're literally arguing a point, you know, they're trying to get someone to be like, no, 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 see things my way. So I'm just curious if that would also translate to, the things that you want to put in place and the kind of programs that you want to run. Yeah. I feel like, um, it is a pretty good overlay. Um, and I, uh, I'm trying, I've been trying to kind of figure out this kind of spiritual component that goes along with this. And I'm not sure where that fits into, uh, I think maybe the, the spirit is like, uh, created by it's like a field that's created it's kind of like if you took maybe if the sides of the uh, triangle are they're all magnets um, I'd have to figure out if the poles would work like that but uh, then the field that's created by the magnets is the spiritual part um, so yeah I think there's a there's an overlay there for sure Maybe instead of using the word overlay, you could use the word framework. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. You know, that's a popular buzzword these days. What's the framework, right? Um, I, I just, um, I really think it, it helps to inform how we are paying attention to our prospect. If we think about those three aspects now, you know, you know, it's kind of like, you know, um, um, well, there's a, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes or something I think talks about how a cord of three strands can't be broken, right? So if you can connect with someone emotionally, you can connect with them mentally or intellectually, and you can connect with them physically, not in the sense of like, you know, I'm going to like have a sexual or um, like, like, I don't mean like hugging somebody, right? Um, physically connecting with someone could simply be as simple as shaking their hands. You're physically present. Um, and then I don't know if anybody's told you stuff like this, but you know, when you sit down at the kitchen table, do you know how to manage a kitchen table setting? Like when you sit down with somebody 
physically or at a conference table. So if you sit on opposite sides of the table, what, what, what's that mentally connotes for you? We're playing battleship. Exactly. Opposite opposing, right? So whenever you're in a sales encounter or you're in a negotiating type of environment and you're sitting down at a table at a minimum, you want to be catty corner to each other. And at maximum, you want to be sitting next to each other because that non-verbally communicates that we're on the same page, we're on the same side of the table, we're working together, right? So your words, how you verbalize, the things that you talk about, you want to be talking about, you know, we, how do we get you, right? You know, the, you know if you've ever heard of the royal we, right? You know, it's that whole concept. So, you know, building, building teamwork in the presentation, you know, if you're talking to somebody over the phone, then you got to figure out how to create that, you know, that mental image, if you will. Um, you know, well, let me work with you here. How can, how can we work together on or help me understand how you're perceiving blah, 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 right? You know, Stephen Covey talks about um, seek first to understand, then seek to be understood. Well, that's absolutely true in the selling process. If, if, if all you do, if all you do is, um, how should I put this? If, if all you do is, you know, talk, 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 and you're always just sending, 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 and you're not getting any feedback on where the other person is, your ability to close that deal is like throwing darts at a wall, right? Like, did I hit it? Like, I might as well be throwing darts in the dark behind my back. I, well, I hope I hit it. I'm throwing a lot of darts. Something's going to hit, right? Well, unfortunately, some people get pissed off, Right. So your ability to be aware of not only yourself and how you're presenting yourself, but of how you are being perceived. And that really has to be a combination of, you know, you really being attuned to how they're communicating to you and then asking quality questions to try to get their sense of, you know, do they like me? Do they trust me? Do they like or trust my company? They're, you know, like, you know, quality question might be, so that's a lot of uh, credentials and, uh, you know, the company's achieved quite a bit. What stands out to you as some positive things there, right? Well, when they start verbalizing back to you what they like about the company, I think you'll get a pretty good sense of, you know, whatever, right? Uh, how they're feeling it. Um, the, the two books that I'm reading right now is Chris Voss on um, how to negotiate without giving up or how to negotiate as if your life depends on it or something like that. I can't remember. That's really good. And um, the follow on book that I'm reading to that is Robert Cialdini's. Um, I don't know. It's like the psychology of persuasion or something. I can't remember what that's called now. I'm obviously very persuaded, <laughs> but a lot of what Cialdini talks about is the concept of reciprocity and how that's, you know, built into a societally norms, you know, all that sort of thing. So those are a couple of books that, you know, I think you put these three books, you put those three books together and that really makes you dangerous as a salesperson, just in terms of even if you only take away, let's say 30 or 40 percent of the content from each of the books, it'll still make you far better and far more effective at, you know, communicating to close. Right. As opposed to talking to hear yourself speak. Right. You know, I think there's a huge difference between talking at someone and communicating to close because communicating to close You've got two ears and one mouth, so you can listen twice as much as you speak. And the more the other person's talking, the more you're selling, right? So if you ask the right questions, uncover the right information, a lot of times people will talk themselves into the sale. You just gotta like, well, here's how we get started. And you just gotta be really attuned to those buying questions, right? So what's it look like to get started with you? Or, or how do we get this process going, right? A lot of people will talk themselves out of a sale because they continue their presentation because they think they gotta finish, right? Did you guys ever see the movie The Accountant with Ben Affleck? He literally killed people so he could finish, right? So in sales terminology, sometimes finishing means you're killing the deal. Don't, you know, listen to the client and you need to know when you need to pivot to the paperwork to just close the deal, right? You got to know when to shut up. What that, that makes me think is, and I think I have a lot of room to practice on this, but it really sounds like as coaches, we ought to be great salespeople um, if we can ask the right questions. 
because we wouldn't have to do the sale. We don't have to do any selling. We just have to basically ask the questions that evoke from the client their need for the product. Well, there's actually a book out there called, I think it's called Power Questions. And you should really have four to 10 power questions, meaning questions that are very impactful that relate to what you do. And when you ask the right questions and you kind of guide the customer's feedback, a lot of times they're just going to say, well, what do I need to get started with you? This makes so much sense, right? You know, like, um, you know, um, I can't, well, I can't think of anything right now, but I mean, you know, there's, there's just, there's a lot of questions that I ask people depending on the sales situation I'm in the product or the service I'm working with. But, you know, it's like, so how long have you been experiencing, I don't know, how long have you been experiencing poor sales performance? How important is you to solve that problem? Why is it important to solve that problem? If you could increase your overall revenues by 20 to 30%, what kind of an impact is that going to have on you, you personally in terms of income, on your company in terms of revenue? Um, you know, what's that going to do for you? Um, you, know, how you, you know, how are you going to emotionally feel about where you work, right? Uh, well, I just think that the biggest takeaway for me today was kind of like what James was just saying is, you know, he and I especially were trained in the same program, which is to ask powerful questions. And I had never thought until the combination of what you said and what he just said is, oh, right. The most powerful question I could ask is something that turns a prospect into a client and I have no background or training or practice in that whatsoever. But that was the biggest light bulb for me, which is, oh, that's something I want to, like you, you mentioned, it's a muscle, you know, like I want to develop that muscle of getting so, people to have that powerful question drop on them and go, I'm going to sell myself on you, not me trying to sell them. So, yeah, I, I find that trying to talk people into things never works, right? Just like you can't talk a client into solving their problem as a coach or a mentor, right? You guys have both told me that you've been coached on, you know, the client has the solution. I just need to help them uncover it. So I, I guess what I would say to you, Shane, is you, you, you need to ask, if you look at Jordan Belfort's system, aside from the three things of, do you like me? Do you like my company? Do you like what I'm offering, right? Like those three things. The questions that you need to ask, you, you need to be working on their action threshold and their pain threshold, right? You know, their action, their, you, you need to make sure that you dial in on the pain threshold, right? Because the higher that pain threshold gets, A, the more they're willing to spend, and B, the more likely they're, they are to spend it now. The action threshold is just helping them get comfortable with you so that the, you know, you just, you have to get them to where they're willing to pull the trigger. And, you know, if you see the action threshold and the pain threshold kind of like, let's see, as a, as a graph, right? You, you bring the you bring the action threshold down, you bring the, the pain threshold up. And when those two connect, right, and then intersect, your zone of decision is, well, here, right? That's your zone of decision. Because if the, if, the, if the action threshold continues to go down, but there's no pain, they're not going to decide, right? But if the pain continues to go up at some point, you know, they have to make a decision, right? Just you want them to make a decision with you, not somebody else. So I guess that's a final point. I don't know. Any other final thoughts, James? That was super helpful. I really like the, the physical, mental, and emotional because it helps me remember to tune into my client on all those levels. It also helps me remember to regulate myself on all those levels. So if I am becoming fatigued, if I'm experiencing fear or whatever, I just have to regulate all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one of the things we talk about in my world is, you know, the grind, right? You get no, 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 right? You got to, you know, it, it can be really hard to be mentally and emotionally up when you finally get somebody that's ready to talk to you, right? Like I just had... 50 people tell me no. And all of a sudden, wait, Oh, they're interested. Oh, wait, what do I do now? Right. So, you know, some of the things that you can do to kind of gamesmanship or mentally manage yourself is if you look at your activity versus what you make, 
like I can take my business and I can tell somebody, Hey, if you go out and you're spending X amount of time generating knocking doors, and as long as you're doing it in the right neighborhoods, I can show somebody on paper where they're going to make at least $25 an hour. And you can tell some, you can, every time somebody tells you no, or they're nasty or whatever, just say, Hey, just want to thank you for the $15. And they're like, what? Oh yeah. Every time somebody says no to me, it's worth $15. So I just want to say thank you for the $15. And they will be like, what? But what you're doing is you've assigned a value, right? You can't get to your yeses unless you've gotten enough no's. Get your no's. Mm, I like it. Get your no's. You got to figure out what your no's are worth. So Peter Drucker says what gets measured gets done. So if you don't measure your activity, you have no idea what your time is worth. So if you know what your average deal is worth and you know, you know, roughly how much activity it takes to get that deal, then you can assign a value to that activity so you know what it's actually creating for you, right? Most people make the mistake of looking at that activity like sending emails, making phone calls, or knocking doors as a time suck, as a as an energy waster. But if you look at it as this is how I feed my pipeline, you can flip the script and you can manage yourself to being up and you can have a positive reaction to somebody else telling you no. Hi, I'm Shane Borza, a climber, creator, and coach. And I want you to build the skill of health and fitness. My new course is a priceless gift to you and it's available exclusively on PonoQuest.com. That's P-O-N-O quest.com. Build the Skill is a minimalistic, functional, real world fitness program, which can help you to move better and get stronger faster. I can't wait for you to check it out. And when you do, please let me know how it helps you. That's Build the Skill at PonoQuest.com. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Solve Network. As a reminder, these calls are held live on the first and third Thursday of each month. If you'd like to join us as either a listener or guest expert, please contact me at shaneborza.com. On behalf of my co-founder, Benjamin Goss, we're glad you are a part of the network and hope you are finding solutions. If you need solutions, please reach out.